she has been on air from uh, between four and six this morning, so we can let you off, can't we? Oh, yeah, as long as it's three o'clock, we did the show at four o'clock. Thanks about that for that. For too long. Brilliant. So we'll do the formal introduction <laughs> and start the session. So it gives me very great pleasure now that she's awake to introduce our next guest. <laughs> she is lovely. She's lively. She is a legend of TV and radio presenting. And she used to come to Leeds Trinity. It is Lauren Layfield. Please give her a warm <laughs> I do appreciate it. So if we can, shall we show your show reel first to give them a taste of all the amazing things that you've done? Is that all right? If you do that, I'll just continue for a minute. Yeah, good idea, good plan. <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, <laughs> At the swipe of a filter, you can get that airbrushed, unblemished look, make your eyes bigger, make your lips bigger, even make your face slimmer. Now, I have to confess, I have used them myself, but all of these flawless images on social media are making people feel really bad about the way that they look, with some saying that filters are causing more harm than good. What was the moment where you decided, actually, this has gone from being a little bit of fun to being quite serious now? I started looking in the mirror and pinpointing on my face where I could get, um, surgery. Do you know what? It took courage for Sophia and Brits to open up today because let's face it, loads of us live our lives through a filter. I just hope today is the first step towards these young women feeling happier about the way they look naturally. Lovely to see you. We are in our backstage TV and it is stunning to be frank. It is stunning. Welcome to day two of the CBC Summer Social and if you thought yesterday was good, <laughs> well, here's what's coming up today. Welcome to the dog game, my homework. And on Lion's team, a comedian who says he doesn't know the meaning of the word fail, which is probably why he failed his English exam, it's our pleasure! <laughs> Young British footballers are currently tearing it up across Europe at the minute. I'm here in Manchester at a five-side tournament that are looking to find the next one to get. <laughs> yeah, match of the day, at elevate football. Hello and welcome to Don't Filter Feelings. If you've listened to this podcast before, welcome back. And if this is the first time you've had us in your ears, then hello. I'm Lauren Layfield, and on this podcast, we have conversations about issues that matter with people who have stories to share. You you would have behaved in a way that was racist. Yeah. You, would it be fair to say you were a racist? Yeah, I mean, really, it was a complete ideology of hate, you know, whether it was blacks, Jews, Catholics, Asians, it was actually all embracing. And if I'm being honest, you know, they, they were there to be taken out. People have, have made a decision to choose and say, I am a, a man or I am a woman, and then someone's trying to remove that from them. Yeah. It feels particularly nasty. It's hard for them. Uh, but the good news, we've got a jam-packed show for you. With your talent, look at that. Go on, go on, get your life. <laughs> what do you think of my dance moves? <laughs> oh, oh my god, you shocked me. <laughs> I was cast as Mary yeah. in my school nativity for six years in a row. Six years? So all the other like girls were like, oh, I want you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I think I believe you. You do? Yeah. He's going to say the truth? Yeah. I'm lying. Well, I'm actually, I was cast as the donkey two years in a row. I feel like social media around football can be pretty difficult, generally speaking, but what is that like for you as a woman? Social media can be a really great place, but like, why would a grown man put a comment on my social media telling me to go back in the kitchen? There have been men who go like this, like, oh, in a sort of calm down, oh, bless. Do you think we can ever cure the problem of sexism? Will it ever go away? Just think about what you can do today, where you have power and how you can use it. The UK period product industry is worth over 300 million pounds. So keeping sales figures high is big business. One teaspoon of blood can actually look like 
quite a bit, but it's not as much as we think. I thought I was dying. No, 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 you're still here. So do you not find it really odd to talk about it? I don't mind talking about it. You don't mind talking about it. I love talking about it. <laughs> Sorry, we missed that. Can you hear me? Oh. Hang on. Oh, hello. Hello. Right, we're back with you. You, you Enjoy just. Some Zoom, guys. I think you just missed a big round of applause. Can we do that again then? <laughs> Brilliant. Looking beautiful. <laughs> So you've done, as we've just seen, you've done such an amazing mix of jobs and stories in your career from sort of really hard hitting to, you know, very light entertainment. So can you just take us, um, tell us about your journey from doing the broadcast journalism MA here at Leeds Trinity to where you are now? And, uh, and please, you know, you could probably fill about five hours doing that, but yeah. What have been the sort of I'm highlights? Genuinely, I mean... It has been like a really long journey, but I'll keep sort of thinking about it. Um, essentially, I finished the course um, at Trinity and I went, right, okay, where do we go with it? We were really lucky because during the Lee Trinity course, they give a ton of uh, regular placement. I've got my foot in the door at the course in Bradford, as it was wonderful. It's um, and Straight away, they put me on air at the polls. And then sort of straight away, I just was like, oh, that's the bit that I, I really like doing. I kind of like the thrill of being on, on live broadcasting. Um, so I, started, I, I generally, at that stage, thought I was going to be like a hard journalist at that point. And um, as it just so happened, I mean, my partner happened to move to Manchester. He moved to the CBC. I ended up getting the job um, Doing journalism, but on the walk show, so I made that kind of moving. The one show I ended up on to Blue Peter, which is obviously um, sort of a similar magazine format, making those kinds of films. This is all behind the scenes, and it was and it was when I was at um, Blue Peter that I think people sort of started going, "Oh, we like her behind us. Maybe we should shove her on on the TV and see what happens." Uh, which is kind of essentially what happened. They just kind of gave me a shot and off I, off I sort of went. And from those kind of pleasant communities at CBC early days, I ended up uh, bouncing now into sort of what I, what I call uh, adult television, but you've got to be careful when you say adult television because it sounds like something completely naughty. Um, grown up television, we tend to call it grown up television. And um, yeah, I ended up sort of doing bits of one show and obviously I'm, I do lots of capital and, and sleep into it, mate. So uh, it's, it's been mad. It's been a utter mix of, of different little things that if you'd asked me back at Leeds Trinity, did I expect to have done all those things? I would have said absolutely not. It's weird. Life will take you in really, really weird directions. That's all I can say. You can't plan for it. And I was going to say that sort of taking you back to, to your time here, what what advice would you give your younger self, your student self? Um, I must admit, I feel like I did pretty much as I wanted to do it. Because I remember knowing that, that course was one year, one year only. So you had one year to really kind of make a difference. And I remember thinking, there was... I'm like, wow, like, we, I was so busy because I was, I remember I was juggling and um, doing all of the coursework that was due to stay on the Monday. And the same week, I was down at Sky News in London doing a placement at the very same time. And I remember thinking, I could totally just say to Sky here, Sky, I'm really sorry. I, I, I'm really struggling to get all my coursework done. And, and, and I was having to trek, like, my, my auntie was living in sort of, um, West London, Sky was in East London or vice versa. It was taking me an hour and a half to get there every day. Then I was doing like 
nine hours at Sky, then I was coming back and I was doing the work on the tube, then I was coming back and doing the work in the evening late to the night. And I remember thinking, I couldn't ask Sky here to just kind of cut me some flack, or I could ask Lucy to say, can I have a bit of an extension? And I thought, no, just go for it, because this is one time in your life where you can really, really slam it, and if you absolutely slam the work, you, you will, I do believe it will pay off, I do believe hard work will, will pay off there, and I certainly, it, it did for me, so, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that I stuck to the advice I've given work really hard during this, like, opportunity while you can, just really go for it, make all the context you can, um, and you just try and get in as many places and speak to as many people as possible, so if you do that now, it genuinely will pay off, it actually comes to that. Fantastic advice that brilliant and um what have been if the if there's kind of one standout moment of your career so far you know sort of being particularly hilarious or just your most sort of memorable moment i mean in, in a sense that clip that went viral with me last year was in its own right a standout moment because it was such an innocuous normal everyday part of what we we did at CBC. We we were just there to be silly and have fun and it was it was a joy being to mess up on my television. We've got we've and, got but usually that kind of we've got away into the ether and it would never be seen again. So when it went viral it was like, oh my god, this is brilliant. It resonated with so so many people. That was that was hilarious. On all serious side, it's been really nice being able to do um, sort of make those leaps, uh, say from sort of children's television to the one show. That felt like a real achievement to me because often you feel like when you do one thing, you might get stuck doing that kind of one thing, and you really want to hope that all this fun that you're having will translate into another part of the industry and that your career will keep on going. So when I did my first one show film, I remember I was walking through this park, we were interviewing somebody about, I think it was spiking or something, like that, and I knew I should be quite sad and down and dire that day, but actually I was so elated to just be on this shoot, going, oh my god, I'm doing something for the one show, this is absolutely amazing. Um, so there's, there's been a few, yeah, there's been a, just a I mean, there's, there's been, I'm not in a kind of boast word, but there's been so many things that made me feel so lucky to be a part of, I just can't, it. Just going back to the viral clip, then we're gonna. I think we're gonna play that if you don't mind, because it just it just makes everybody course, laugh, yeah. and it's just a good. It's kind of a good thing to do. Um, I think we've just got some new visitors arriving, so we'll just give them a minute just to settle, and then they can actually watch it if that's all right. But how many? Just tell us how many. Nice. How 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 many hits did it get? What? How many was it? Was it mil It was millions, wasn't it? Was I, it? I it's millions, millions, millions. I mean, like, obviously now you count over all sorts of different platforms, don't you? you it's Twitter and Instagram and it's TikTok and it's everything. And you go, uh, you know, on mine alone, I think it did about sort of five million or something. And then on the on the, on the puppets, sorry, it's the puppet guys, don't mean to ruin the fun, it's, it is an actual puppet. On the puppets Instagram, that did about 10 million. And in series news accounts, it did another 7 million. It's just, yeah, unfathomable that people take such joy from it and people sort of go, I don't know why I find it funny, I just do. And in this day and age, when everything's very serious, surely that's what life's about, it's just finding, finding the fun in stuff, right? Brilliant. We'll play it now, thanks. I know. Very early. We're just normal men. Here we go, we've got it. What do you mean, normal men? We're just innocent men. <laughs> <laughs> We're playing for H2Q with our little one. So we like to play H2Q, even on Super Mr. Happy, it's all the kind of all you can get. Oh, you do it. Dude, can you get permission? I'll leave your phone number because by Jingo, it only works in this video. You're just kidding, you love this. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's that literally is the epitome of me not doing my job well, so it really doesn't deserve a round of applause. That's me doing everything the producers say not to do, which is that if something goes wrong, you're supposed to carry on, you know, if you, 
supposed to you know, listen to the producers, they're going to give you direction about what to say. And instead, I'm laughing so hard, I just I can't hear a single thing that's coming through my earpiece of the gallery. So, um, but those are always the those are always the best moments of CBC, I think. Absolutely, and the, don't you think the viewers love that? One hundred percent, and I think that goes for most things in this industry that we make. I think it's we, you can do do sort of all the standard stuff that's expecting, but the moments of like brilliance will come when you sort of slightly go outside of the box. I think. And I'm going to attempt to make you corpse live on air here in the lecture theatre by saying the words yeah. roller yeah. derby. You got to say it if you cut up, so. I'm also going to look at my technology. <laughs> roller derby. Oh my God. Do you know what? I've still got a copy of that. On my, let go back to the proudest things I've ever done. That's not there, for sure. <laughs> that was one of the pieces that I had to make for my final artifacts, uh, for my assessments. And um, I went along and did a roller derby piece. I think I did, if I remember correctly, I did sort of a grown up version. And then I did a children's version, which got sent to News Round as, a, as part of this mission to come and do. Um, Four weeks placement with news round and my my piece won that so i was thrilled with that but essentially it was just me basically being an idiot on on roller skates with these really big burly women who could knock me out in a heartbeat and um, i still can't listen to tiny tempers pass out because i edited that piece of work so many times that song has left me with like ptsd <laughs> And didn't you get injured? I think you. I think no, you, you, you did come. Yet. Yeah, you did come back black and blue from that. That was sort of true dedication to the job. You've got to commit, haven't you? That's the thing. Again, there's no point being there unless you're going to commit. And full of bruises all over the place. <laughs> So we've we've sort of talked about funny experiences. Have you have you had any sort of really cringy experiences at any point? I think in the, in the early days of going live, I used to find that really, really cringy because in the early days, you really are, with, with anything you end up doing, you, in those first days when you first graduate or you first get your, your opportunity to do the thing that you love, you really don't know what you're doing. And I think one thing that Lee Trinity really taught me to do was just to be a, like a chief blagger. And it was that idea of just like, I remember Richard Horsman always used to send us into network events, which I hate to this day. And he would always just be like, go and talk to that really important person over there. And I'd be like, oh, I don't want to, it's just so embarrassing. Why, what was he going to say? Why, why is that person going to be interested in me? And I always found it just like awful. But I think Richard Horsman always used to encourage you just to like it. it why, you know, why should you go and talk to them? Why not? And it was the same with those first early days of going live. It, it felt like you just had to go and blag it and pretend that you knew what you were doing, and I absolutely didn't. So there were so many times when people were like, I completely forget my words, and we were live, and you don't have any auto cue at CBC or anything like that. Um, and and, and I, I'd, I'd freeze and wouldn't know what to say. And it's just the most like, oh, gut wrenching kind of feeling that you get. There's loads of instances like that. There was just loads of instances this last night. Still, I did an absolute howler the other day at a networking event, which I actually can't actually say on this call because it is not only embarrassing, but it's a little bit embarrassing to a big, big box at Channel 4. And I couldn't sleep that night. I literally couldn't sleep because I was so mortified. So there's, there's just, I think the industry of the media is very open and and there's nowhere really to hide and you meet a lot of people and where their hearts on their sleeves and I think that um, you quickly have to get over embarrassment I think in this industry is one of the things that I think we've you've maybe frozen on the screen but can you still hear me you're back right okay oh, I think that's better oh can't hear you really wish I'd like train to leave this morning guys. yes <laughs> She was gonna come, she I was gonna come, it. but the trend is I hate it. Like another like, good life lesson, soon is why I use that industry, but nothing will meet people, beat meeting people face to face. <laughs> so you were that was quite interesting what you're saying about sort of being embarrassed and not liking networking, because I would have you down as sort of you know, sort of comedy genius, 
naturally extrovert, all the rest. But I know you do do some work, don't you, with the with the charity Young Minds Mental Health Charity. Yeah. So you know, what would you say to our students? You know, a lot of our students are you know sort of do suffer anxiety and and are quite sort of nervous because and especially going into broadcasting, you just think, do you have to be a an, an sort of naturally big personality? You know, what, what yeah. advice would you give people that think I could never do that? It's actually it's such a like a common question as well. I remember like our group with our cohort of students at least we were all pretty extroverted. And then there was a couple who were really um, introverted people. And I th- I think within any kind of introverted I have as well, I consider myself an introverted extrovert, if you like. It's like that kind of person that will do the big outward stuff, but you need that time to kind of recoup and, and gather your thoughts back together. And I've, I've worked out over the years, that's very much what I am. But introverted introverted people are the ones to do some of the best the best things. One of the girls is now, I think, a big wig on uh, breakfast, I think she is. Laura Pennington, where's Laura now? Do you know who Laura is? Yeah, I think she's, she's somewhere. She, I can't remember, she's not my big anyway. And, and I think it's one of those things where it's like, you would assume that everybody in this industry is is that kind of big personality kind of person, but nobody truly is. Even the, the big characters are, are not, often the big characters are the ones that are absolutely fraught with um, other anxieties about sort of, you know, are they being big enough or are they keeping enough or are they doing enough? Or, so you get a lot of that, and I think a lot of the introverted people are the really um, important people that crack on with a lot of the kind of important like editorial work or you know really make it happen sort of behind the scenes. And then to completely go against what I've just said, I met a really really super introverted girl on uh, Blue Peter, and we worked together behind the scenes, and um, I had no idea that she had any aspiration present what's the her and she went along and kept talking to these execs and they kept saying well you're so shy how can you be a presenter well now she's a presenter and she does a bit of news round she does stuff um well speaking so she does loads on BBC Wales um and she's brilliant and what I say is that what she does in front of the camera is different to who she is sort of behind the camera but that doesn't mean you're the same Person. I mean, it's a job and a job as well. So it's hard, it's hard to be that extroverted person, and you will miss those, you will meet all people who are like that. And um, you've got to realize there is there is absolutely value in an introvert as well. And you've got your um, debut novel, haven't you, coming out in April? Indie Ray is totally faking it. Plug for your book there. Yeah. Is, is there a little bit of you in there then? With the you know, oh, it's like, yeah, it's it's one hundred percent all of my calamities put into a book. Basically, it's, it's essentially not very cool because it's just me writing my stories to <laughs> kind of the book. Um, so yeah, there's loads of those kind of teenage uh, mistakes that you make, and and essentially a lot of it again is, is about how I don't know about how you guys felt as teenagers, particularly when I was a teenager. It was all about liking it and and wanting to fit in. And turns out that never really ends, guys. I'm in my mid-30s now, and I'm still trying to like it, fit in at work. So I think it's hopefully one of those common denominators that we all share, which is the idea of just sort of, uh, yeah, wanting to be accepted amongst people and people not being the weird. Just going back to um, your time at, at CBBC, obviously the BBC has decided to, to move it all online. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts about that? So the rational part of my brain goes, where are young people consuming content now? They consume it online. Like, and, and every part of my rational brain is saying that and going, it, you know, that's the space they're in. Very few young people come and um, sit down and watch children's television after school in the same way that I did when I was younger. So I do get it. There's also this massive part of me that goes, when we look at the decision to do that with BBC3, 
I don't know if fail is the word. I haven't seen the stats, but from the outwards, sort of appearance, it didn't look like it did well. It compared a lot of that, that see, to the point that you see then went, oh my gosh, we need to we need to bring back the sort of teenagers, young 20 year olds because they've gone. And, and now, if, if you've not got the children jumping onto that middle sort of age group, how are they then going to move on and find quickly and you know, all the other sort of things that we do for the grown up? So there's been a massive relook there to kind of capture that audience back again. So it's a really good one. I, I would be really glad to see the, that department, which basically gave me so much, CBC gave me the most out of like, everything I've done since I left the agency. I think it would be really, really sad to see that go, particularly for acquiring presenters, because it's such a good place to kind of um, cut your, your know, teeth and, and 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 work out and make all those mistakes, like corpses on live television, make all those mistakes before you go and do it on into the lot. So yeah, I'm, I'm like this with it. And it's of course like news round on CBBC, um, and you've done some um, amazing work for news round, and you've been um, nominated for an international Emmy. For your fantastic program, let's talk about periods. So, when when do you find out about that? Is it when do you? Yeah, we out? fly next week to New York. We get to go to a very fancy uh, ceremony. and do a red carpet and all that kind of stuff, and uh, we find out next week. We work. We're up against essentially the international Emmys are a sort of what they call the best of the best outside of America, essentially. Um, and we're in a really strong category. There's a great, I think it's a Norwegian program about uh, climate change. They've done with children and showing what happens if a child gets caught out and there's a leaky glacier and stuff. It's got amazing graphic. So I don't know if we'll win, but uh, we're very, yeah, very proud to, to be nominated for it. We are. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure we all wish you the best of luck with that, and we'll be rooting for you. I think um, we'll open it up to questions from the from the floor now. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear. I'm just going to stand over by the lectern, and then I can kind of maybe relay them to you um, if you can uh, hear them. Okay. Hi, Lauren. I, I wanted to ask you when you first <laughs> sort of thought of going into the industry. Cause I knew I wanted to go into the industry at about 14, 15. What age did you want to go into the industry? I did. Before I came to Leeds City, I did a drama degree um, at Lincoln. And it was a waste of three years and a waste of £21,000 because I turned out didn't want to do drama at all. And I got halfway through the drama degree, so a year and a half, and I and I and I looked and my mentors, my I was one of my best mates. Um, they brought the journalism course, and I looked at them and I was like, and I and I debated about changing then to a journalism course. Oh, that looks so much more exciting! It had that element of performance which I kind of got from drama, but it had all this. Big, Technology and finding stories and, and talking to people and it being based in real life and I thought about it and then I thought no because I don't want to be a year, you know a year and a half behind than else again so I sort of stuck it out and then luckily found Leeds Trinity and kind of came on to that and even still when I came to Leeds Trinity I was still a bit like I don't know if it's like, gonna gonna work out for me but let's just let's just give it a go basically. Um, and luckily, I came to Leeds and absolutely loved it, um, and that really kind of secured the idea. Of, I think once you do a course at Leeds, you can't not really want to work in this industry in some kind of way. Because what's wicked about it is it, there's so many different avenues that you can go and do after you've done this course. It, you know, there's a lot of people that are on the course that aren't necessarily working in like TV or radio anymore, but they're working, say, for like marketing companies, for, for brands, or, or um, they're doing comms for, you know, football clubs and things like that. So it opens up so many doors. But it was leading into the, yeah, secure there, basically. Any questions? <laughs> 
Hi, I'd just like to ask you um, a little bit about your time with CBBC, um, with the, you know, with just innocent men bit. Uh, that was improvised, right? And would you say that with puppetry, I'm a big fan of puppetry, um, would you say there's more or less room for improvisation with puppetry in all kinds of... More or less room for improvisation with puppetry, would, would, what would you say? Um, I think it very much depends on the production that you're on. So the puppeteers that I work with at CBC are legitimately not in the country. A, because they're good, but B, because there's not that many puppeteers in the country. It's not a huge, well-known job, right? So, they are brilliant. But um, they've done other things. It's very interesting to compare what they, they've done compared to CBC. So, um, one of the puppets who played Dodge, not Hacker, Dodge was the other puppet uh, from a few years back. He's done a lot of, um, he's in my Sesame Street, um, he's done, um, The Dark Crystal was a massive Netflix production, that's a sort of an like, 80 show that they, they kind of revamped and did again a few years back. And on that, very rigid, the scripting is there, you know, the, the head movements that they do have to be absolutely exact. And what I love was when they came to see, they have this sort of fluidity just to, yeah, totally riff and do what they want. And that was the great thing about CBC generally is that you didn't get a script at CBC. There was no script as such. What we got was a, a piece of paper that bullet pointed sort of what we were going to do across the next few minutes. So you say, you know, you can say your hellos, and then we're going to uh, tell you what's coming up uh, this afternoon, and then we're going to do a little bit of a sketch kind of thing, a bit of talking point around this, and then at the end we're going to ask the viewers to send in their comments, and then we're going to throw it to the show. And that's really, it was, it was really bare bones. And, and for that reason, I, a part of the fun came in sort of making each other laugh. You do like six or seven links across the afternoon. You know, you want to make sure that everyone brings you joy of anybody else. So you got to just do like stuff. And I think for the puppeteers, that it's such a lovely place for them to craft their art and, and, and do new things, you know, stupid things. We're not doing that, but it's about a 10 minute video, but there is a bloopers reel on my, on my YouTube of Hacker just going off on one, basically. And he would just do the most ridiculous things, like stretch his neck really high, or, you know, drop things, or, you know, just those things that, all on him. Well, no director's going to do that all of them. And yeah, they're magical at what they do, it's amazing. Hi, Lauren. Yeah, I just wanted to know, um, in terms of the differences between presenting for TV and radio, uh, both live and in pre-production, what, what are the main differences and perhaps what do you enjoy more most? Oh, it's a, I love both for different reasons. I love radio because I love walking in in the morning basically looking like this. Um, you make one strip of hair up and run, off you go, open the mic and away you go. So that's really nice. That's style. Your capital, which is how I am, is different to your radio one, which is different to your kiss. Everywhere is different. And um, the style at capital is very much you have to kind of keep it up, keep it excited, keep it kind of quite snappy and brief. There's no, there's going to be no four minute links on on capital. Um, however, having said that, that tightness in my hair on capital, mine because I'm a very show. I just try to keep it dead chatty and and uh, you know not not throwing too much at the listeners. Uh, ears that early in the morning. Maybe because I haven't got it in me to throw that much at them either. Um, so there's that kind of with radio. And then with television, again, everything's different. Um, with CBC, there was a little bit of that kind of casualness, I guess. Um, with the Wall Show, though, for example, everything, again, is, is a script and it's about sort of turning something up that maybe, I don't want to say dry, because the Wall Show tends to do quite good. Stories, but something that's quite sort of uh, serious sometimes, and sort of adding a little bit of you to it, adding your own sort of um, twist on it to make it sort of interesting. But generally, that is about sort of being very clear, very concise, and telling people the information in a way that's very understandable. So there is a ton of different skills, and what I've learned is it, what applies to radio and then TV. It, it, it's sort of not as black and black and white. Every way you go, every single job you do, 
you have to adapt and, and do it in a way that's going to suit basically whoever's employed you so that they employ you again. Yeah. Any more questions? I've got one, Lauren. Um, I'm good friends with your old course mate, Kat Mars, so she said to say hi as well uh, today. Hi, you, I'm sorry, I missed you. Say it again. Um, I'm really good friends with your ex course mate, Kat Mars, so she said to say hi because um, she knew we were speaking to you today. Um, my question is you talked earlier about not being pigeonholed, obviously, kind of going from different um, broadcasters. How do you make sure that you show how diverse you are to different employers? I think. When, when I do what I do, sort of diversity, there's sort of no option really um, because there's not a lot of jobs in, in the industry. There's not, you know, there's not a whole lot of jobs for taking. So you have to um, show that you can be diverse and that you can adapt uh, because the last thing, you know, the last thing the one show would have wanted would have been me coming along and showing me sitting about with a puppet, right? And the last thing CBC would want is me coming and being so straight and serious that they go, well, this isn't Sean's TV. So I think the best way to do any of that is like do your research beforehand. Like go and look at, you know, for example, I'm doing The Weakest Link on um, Saturday, Sunday. Now I've never been a contestant on The Weakest Link before. I'm going to go and just give it a go. But there was a bit of me that was just like, oh, how? So how am I supposed to behave, or, or, or less about what, how am I supposed to behave, but what can I get away with personality-wise? How much personality do they want, and, and how much would be too much and too annoying, you know? And so I've got to watch an episode of, of the Week Sleep, Week, Week Sleep with Ramesh um, presenting it, just to see what the vibe is. And I think if you can go into a job, any job that you do, sort of having a bit of knowledge about what they expect, you're just placing yourself in the best possible position to come across in the best possible way. And if you come across in the best possible way, the more likely they're gonna in, enjoy what you do. And that is so, that's such a massive part of what I do is just making sure that you're ticking the boxes and people are enjoying what you did. And you did what was asked of you as well. You know, you don't wanna go and do something that's completely out there. I mean, I've been on the other side as well where I've, I've worked behind the scenes. So I've dealt with authentic who come in and I don't know, it tried to be funny when it wasn't expected or, or not given the right amount of energy that I was expecting, it makes your life hard, having to kind of make them be what you need them to be for a certain film or a certain program or whatever it might be. So um, yeah, just do do a ton of research is is the best thing. Hi, Lauren. I wanted to ask about your time at Leeds Trinity University. Uh, with the with the course, um, sometimes it feels like spinning plates with the NCTJ coursework, stuff like that. How do you keep those plates spinning and balanced? Coffee? Uh, <laughs> like I said at the beginning, it's one of those things that you don't you want to do the very best you can, right? Because you're not, you're not, you're not going to do it very long. Well. You want to get the best results you can. I would say you just have to really sort of look at your time and and uh, manage your time. I know that's a really boring thing to say, but for me, I'm such a last minute person. I'm terrible. I will leave my coursework for like a month, and then three days before, I'll go. Oh God, I've got to write like a thousand words, whatever it is. I did it with my book. My book was a joke. I started writing that book four years ago and it got to like the week before it was due in and I still had about 20,000 words to sort out or something. I'm, I'm terrible. So I'm absolutely, I'm saying time management is, as one of those things which I don't do. I don't practice what I preach. Um, but I would recommend that you do it. It's, it is really tough, but I think, sometimes I think it's more about mentality. You're gonna have loads to do. You know you've got to get it done. So I would say think about like the end goal and think about like when I get this done this is what it's going to open up for me or this is what I'm going to achieve or, or even down to little things like when I when I finish this bit of coursework I'm going to go to the pub for a night and enjoy my life for a bit you know and then I'll come back to all of the mess sort of tomorrow um I think that I have to give myself rewards basically I'm like a I'm like a Pavlovian dog <laughs> 
think, yeah, I think we're going to leave it there, Lauren. That's been absolutely incredible. Great advice there from you. So please, can we say a massive thank you to Lauren Layfield. <laughs> Thank you.